Well, welcome back again this week. You know, we have a lot of trouble right now with immigration coming across the borders, flooding our schools and other facilities along the southern border. Uh, and you've, you've read about it all. You're all familiar with it. And a lot of it's coming from Central America, Honduras and, and uh, Guatemala and, and those sorts of places. Interestingly enough, this is a press release from the White House. And uh, it, it talks about solving the problems in Latin America, in the Central American area. And we keep hearing that these kids and these people are coming up because of drug cartels, gangs, uh, all sorts of violence, etc. And yet the United States has spent 642 million since 2008 on this specific problem. It, let me read you just a couple of things off of this press release. And uh, this was released in uh, March of this year, the beginning of March, before the problem that we see being manifested now uh, became a problem. It, didn't, it wasn't visible. <clears throat> but they're telling us that they're solving this problem. A uh, quote from President Barack Obama. As the nations of Central America develop a new regional security strategy, let that, think, let that sink in. As the nations of Central America develop a new regional security strategy, the United States stands ready to do our part through a new partnership that puts the focus where it should be, on the security of citizens. And with regional and international partners, we'll make sure our support is not just well intended, intentioned rather, but is well coordinated and well spent. Well, it's obviously working, isn't it? Uh, and, and let me read a couple of others just to drive the point home. They want to assist law enforcement and security forces to confront narcotics and arms trafficking, gangs, organized crime, and border security deficiencies, as well as to disrupt criminal infrastructure, routes, and networks. They also want to advance community policing, gang prevention, and economic and social programming for at-risk youth and communities disproportionately affected by crime. How's it working out? We've spent, as I said, over $600 million since 19, or excuse me, 2008 on this program. And what do we get? We get immigration into the United States. None of these things are being solved. What is being solved is how to pull these things together into partnerships, security partnerships, social partnerships. We are integrating these things at that level, but down on the street, they're getting worse. At the top level of government, they're pulling the governments together, welding the governments together in their security and social aspects, but not solving the problem. You know, let's, I ask the question in a lot of my talks, uh, what program have we instituted since 1933 that has actually solved the problem it was designed to solve? And uh, I kind of quip, I've got all day for an answer. And the answer is none. And even recently, we are not good by uh, we, I mean our government, is not good at solving problems. The war on poverty, the war on terror, uh, self-sufficiency in oil. They're trying to even stop the self-sufficiency in oil in spite of what our oil companies are doing. Uh, and other issues that they have no ability to solve whatsoever, they get worse. Uh, they can give you statistics, for instance, on the war on poverty, but they don't give you all the statistics at the same time so that you understand that these numbers accumulatively are getting larger. They'll show you one table where it's got it getting lower, where you have lower welfare recipients, but they don't tell you that they've been moving those people over onto the Social Security disability system, which is skyrocketing. So total numbers, the, the numbers keep going up. But if you look at one table or another, 
they can fool you with the idea that it, they're actually going down. But let me segue now into something. When we're talking about bringing all these things together into partnerships and these foreign entanglements, how they can slip things in on you. Now, I have in my hand here something from the European Commission. And it is for their Trade Policy Committee and it is their guidelines for implementing CETA, uh, the Canadian European Trade Administration. And interestingly enough, in a few pages into it, they say something that is quite startling for those of us who have studied the various human rights and so-called bills of rights that the United Nations have established. And in here, they reaffirm in this, uh, this treaty their strong attachment to democracy and fundamental rights as laid down in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Now, the thing is that that sounds innocuous to the average reader who's never actually looked at this document. But this document that purports to give rights to the people and give them from government, not from God, our philosophy is our Creator endowed us with certain inalienable rights. We get our rights from God, in other words. Uh, they say they get their rights from government. That's a problem to begin with. But then they say that you can have these rights as long as they don't violate the purposes and principles of the United Nations. You have freedom of religion as long as it doesn't violate the purposes and principles of the UN. Freedom of assembly, same thing. Freedom of speech, the same thing. And then they even uh, talk about things in such a way that you have uh, freedom of religion, uh, except as prescribed by law and are necessary. I mean, these are the, actually the words from these uh, human rights documents out of the UN. And so they sneak that stuff in to these treaties. Uh, so that you think these treaties have something to do with trade. They have a lot to do with other things, such as the very fundamental uh, aspects of our own government, the Bill of Rights. This is dangerous stuff. And it's buried in the hundreds and thousands of pages in these agreements. And so we have to be very careful. Not only careful, but we just simply have to put a stop to these things. If we don't, it's going to change the very fundamental aspects of our own government. Because a lot of people believe, and these insiders and internationalists have gotten these Americans to believe that treaties supersede the Constitution. Nothing could be further from the truth. They do not. But as long as they implement them that way and get away with doing it, and Congress doesn't stop them, nor the American people putting pressure on Congress to stop them, it will supersede the Constitution in fact, whether or not it's legal. At any rate, these are the sorts of things that they slip in here that, that affect the very fundamental principles of our own Constitution and our American system of government, way beyond trade. So these are the, some of the reasons why we're opposed to these free trade agreements. Until next week, we'll see you then.